What's the word, y'all? We're continuing our series of talking about all 30 NBA teams leading up to the 2024-2025 season. If you missed the last videos, the New York Knicks are done, the Miami Heat are done, and today we landed on the Brooklyn Nets. We went from two of the cooler slash good teams of basketball to maybe the worst team in the league, which is okay. Because even with them being the worst team in the league, potentially they still have some intriguing young players on the roster. I'll be honest with you, I don't know how much I'm going to be watching them at whole next season. But I know that they're setting themselves up for a really good 2025 and even a better 2026. I think they have the roadmap to how to do a quick rebuild slash retooling. And I love it. Like this offseason, there are a lot of big things that happen. You saw the Philadelphia 76ers go out and get an all-star. You saw the Orlando Magic go get a complimentary role player in KCP. Like a lot of good things happened this year. Uh, uh, Alex Caruso and Isaiah Harden's time to OKC. They won the offseason. But my favorite move of the entire offseason was the Brooklyn Nets reacquiring their own first round pick. Because you got to think about something. This team was dead in the water. Where Kevin Durant was gone. Kyrie Irving was gone. James Harden went like that. And they were about to be a bad roster with nothing to show for. And now when you reacquire your own first round pick, you can be the worst team in the league. And hey, we got Cooper Flag. Hey, we got Ace Bailey. And hey, the year after that, we might have a Boozer brother or something like that. But here's the combination of picks. Shout out to Eric Slater for putting it together after the uh, the trade with the Rockets. So again, they have their own first round pick in 2025, which is amazing. They had the uh, Milwaukee Bucks picked it up. If I'm not mistaken, it's top four protected. That's going to convey the Milwaukee Bucks are not about to be one of the four worst teams in basketball. They have the New, a New York Knicks trade um, or pick from the Mikhail Bridges trade, completely unprotected. And that's this year. And if I'm not mistaken, they have one more first round pick that's weirdly protected that might not convey. But other than that, 2026, they have their own first round pick. Then after that, they got no more of their picks until 2029. But they get a Knicks pick. They got a Philly pick. They got a swap with the Suns, which in 2028, who knows what the Suns roster is going to look like. Like they have a treasure chest of first round picks. And again, you think about where they were. This is how you redo a rebuild after failing at the home runs. The last time before this, they failed on some home runs with the KG, Paul Pierce thing. It took them a very long time to try to figure out what direction they can go in. And now I think it's pretty understandable what the, what the path is. We're going to be bad this year. Hell, we might be historically bad this year. You see that roster? Let's talk about it. Now, they are not void of talent, right? Dennis Schroeder, good basketball player. Cam Thomas might average 25. Cam Johnson, really good role player. Dorian Finney Smith, really good role player. Nicholas Claxton on extension, good player. But compared to the other 29 teams of basketball, definitely one of the worst rosters. Off the bench, they got Ben Simmons. And, oh, my God, Chris Brickley said Ben Simmons is back to his all-star form. Hell, he's better than that version of himself. I, I guess we're going to have to wait and see. They got Bogdanovich still on the roster after coming back from the Mikael Bridges trade. Jalen Wilson is probably the most intriguing young player on this team after that summer league. Noah Clowney also is pretty high on that list. And then they got guys like Dayron Sharp who can set records for offensive rebounder percentage, yada, yada, yada. They even traded for Zaire Williams. And one of the reasons I like that is not because I believe that Zaire Williams is about to be the superstar player, but they just needed more young players on the team, more dudes to take shots at. It wasn't too long ago where Zaire Williams was a, was a, um, a lottery pick. And now you put him on a team with not a lot of people in front of him where he can potentially spread his wings. So it's not a good roster. Hell, it's going to be worse come February because a guy like Cam Johnson will be valuable on the market. A guy like Dorian Finney-Smith will be valuable on the market. So this team can look e even worse later in the year. But again, that is okay. Now, with the flattened odds, it makes sense maybe a little bit less than it did five years or six years ago when you had a 25% chance of the first overall pick. When you um when you were the worst team in the league, now it's 14.9 or 15%. Regardless, being the worst team in the league is not maybe as valuable as previous years. But you know what I'm saying? Getting one of the guaranteed top five picks is pretty impressive or pretty important for the 2025 draft. When people saying that's one of the best of all time. But let's take a step back and look at this roster again. Because again, Cam Thomas, um, last year he was phenomenal. I mean, ain't shit funny is one of my favorite memes from, from the last couple years, right? And he's a dude that with this team, he's going to have the ultimate green light. And I think that the front office might have a difficult time trying to evaluate him as far as like what type of money he deserves because he's about to hit restricted free agency. Because the dude could potentially put up, again, 25, 26 a night. But is that 25, 26 as valuable as a 25, 26 on a different team where maybe there's more well constructed in the floor of the offense a little bit better. I don't envy the people that got to make the decision. Obviously, Cam is a really good basketball player, but are you going to pay him like you pay Kate Cunningham, who just got some money in his class, or Evan Mobley or Scotty Barnes? A lot of these dudes, Franz Wagner, just got basically max extensions. 
And if a dude is averaging 25 points per game, it's going to be hard to convince him and his ownership that he's not worth that. Now, if I was in charge, I would tell that brother to hit restrict the free agency. Go get that money somewhere else. So we'll just match it. You know what I'm saying? That happened with Zach Levine here in Chicago where he played half of a season after his ACL tear. And they said, hey, go, go, go get some money somewhere else. And if you can go get that money, we'll match it. We love you here, but we also not trying to tie our books down to you. Like with all of that money, uh, Zach Levine wants to go get an offer from Sacramento, I want to say. The Bulls match it. No harm done. At least until now, where they kind of hate each other. But you get what I'm saying? I do believe there's value in trying to wait and see what restricted free agency brings to these dudes. Not saying that a Kay Cunningham extension, a Scotty Barnes extension, a Franz Wagner extension is not worthy. But I personally want to see what that player looks like going into year number four a little bit more. So Cam might be in that, that group of guys. Because it's him, it's Jalen Green, it's Alperin Shingoon. These are three dudes that have been at least productive young NBA players that have yet to have a contract extension. Next dude is Jalen Wilson. Now, Summer League MVP historically has not meant a ton. Like, if you look through the list of Summer League MVPs, actually, let's do it. It doesn't necessarily say that you're going to be a superstar, right? <laughs> it's uh, Cam Whitmore from the previous year, Keegan Murray, Cam Thomas. They're just getting all of the awards in, in Brooklyn. Davion Mitchell, uh, uh, Brandon Clark, Josh Hart. Like, this is not an amazing group of talent. All these dudes, most of these dudes had long, successful NBA careers. You do get your Damian Lillard, your John Walls, your Blake Griffins in there. But again, for the most part, it doesn't mean that Jalen Wilson's going to be a superstar. But one thing I really love when it comes to Summer League, and one thing I look at, and I watched a lot of Summer League, I remember Jalen Wilson leading that big comeback versus um, maybe Indiana. Um, either way, what it, what I like to look at is year two players that look like they don't deserve to be there. They look too damn good compared to the competition. And that's what you got from Jalen Wilson from all three levels. His rookie season, he averaged like five points per game, three rebounds and an assist, but his three-point shot was like 32%. The free throw percentage was 88%. So you're like, oh my God, you know, he might be able to transition that jump shot. And then the summer league, he shot over 50% from three. And if you watch those games, you would have noticed that he wasn't taking foot on the line threes. He was taking nearly 30 footers a lot of the time. And again, I don't think he about to shoot 50% from three in regular season, but he showed some things as a year two player to like, oh, he deserves to be a rotational piece on this team. And he might be the young player of all of them to blossom the most. Because even like a guy like Noah Clowney, I haven't sold all of my stock on, you know what I'm saying? So there's going to be opportunity from Jalen Wilson to really spread his wings. And I'm excited to see what that could look. So think about it this way, right? 20, 2024, 2025 season, we know the goals. They're going to be bad. Let's say they win the lottery. They get the luck. Boom, Cooper Flag, you're now in Brooklyn. They potentially have 70 plus million dollars to spend. And you like Kenny, bro. They just did this. They brought in two max players and Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant, and it failed miserably. Um, I would agree. It was the biggest what if in maybe my lifetime as an NBA thing. As far as a team construction, maybe the biggest what if ever. But I understand the idea of quickly trying to retool this roster to use that 70 plus million dollars. And that number can go up even more if you trade Dorian Finney Smith, if you trade Cam Thomas. So I don't know the exact number. Let's say you, you have $85 million in cap. I understand winning the lottery, going to get a um, going to get a Cooper Flag, Ace Bailey type of dude, and spending that money. And again, it don't have to be two max players and let it be, but spending that money to retool the roster. And maybe it's similar to what the Houston Rockets just did. Young, intriguing players. Big time cap spaces. We might overpay for a Fred Van Vliet and overpay for a Dylan Brooks, but it's going to add stability to this locker room. It's going to make us be a competitive team. And again, if you go back to Eric's tweet, they have their own first round in 2026 because of the stipend rule. But after that, they don't have their own first round pick to 2029. So, I mean, I guess you maybe look at a world where they try to be bad again for the 2026 draft and go get a boozer, a boozer kid. But after that, there is no incentive to be bad again. You 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 have Brook. I mean, you have uh, New York's picks. You have Philly's picks. You have Phoenix's picks, and some more New York picks. So at that point in time, in your mind, if you're running this team, we have to be at least competent. We're not trying to give up the seventh overall pick. So let's go out there and spend. Let's spend. And again, it don't have to be going to get Jimmy Butler, which is already a rumor before the season even started. It don't have to be a top 10 player. But let's go out there and put together a real roster with the money we spent. And we still have Cooper Flagg. We have um, Cam Thomas. We have Jalen Wilson. And just like that, in just two years' time, we didn't have to go through a rebuild. But instead, we retooled our roster. The, it's all set it up this way. And I don't know... Why they wouldn't go this, this direction. Now, if you're like Kenny, who is that guy? I literally don't know. So let's look at some of the free agents for this season. Brandon Ingram. Um, man, Brandon Ingram. <laughs> Nobody wants to pay Brandon Ingram, right? Nobody wants to pay Brandon Ingram. Maybe we in Brooklyn do. Again, Brooklyn Nets fans, y'all tell me if y'all are interested in any of these dudes. But I'm just looking at the guys that are on this list. 
Alperin Shingun goes restricted, I would assume that no matter what happens, the Houston Rockets are going to um, they're, they're going to match that. They're going to match whatever offers. LeBron James is probably not coming to Brooklyn. He's not coming to Brooklyn. Julius Randle has a player option. We'll see what type of money he decides to turn down or get. Rudy Gobert, player option. Kyrie Irving is not coming back. Jimmy Butler, again, is one of the rumors out there. I don't know how much I buy into that. Miles Turner can't sign his contract until 2025 offseason, but I would assume that he stays in Indiana. Aaron Gordon has a player option. This is not shaping up to be an amazing free agency class, but like, let's, let's take a shot at Jonathan Kaminga. Let's be the team that give him an offer sheet and, and force the, um, the Golden State Warriors to match. Uh, Fred Van Vliet is back. Imagine if Fred Van Vliet gets another crazy deal because another team is trying to retool. Uh, but like D'Angelo Russell is probably not coming back. Okay, this class is not very great. Uh, you got some really quality role players in Alex Caruso and Bruce Brown. You got Brooke Lopez. He probably ain't coming back. Okay. All right. Uh, it's not looking amazing. Uh, an amazing crop of talent. I'd say. <laughs> I'd just say that. It's not looking super great. But But... The idea still stands. <sighs> My God, this class stinks. I was thinking it's possible. You know what? It's possible. Everybody signing extensions early nowadays. Joel B just signed his extension. He won't hit free agency to 2029. So, like, that's why. The star players don't really hit free agency that often. Paul George hitting free agency was pretty interesting. But obviously, whatever. The year after that, you got some names. But probably these dudes are going to sign extensions as well. All I'm saying is that there is a roadmap for the Brooklyn Nets to be back into at least okay and the near future. And they're using this season to kind of evaluate the young talent that they have, maybe flip some of the older guys that they have to give it even more first round picks in the future. I kind of like when teams have to be competitive, right? At the end of the day, a lot of teams like, oh, if we're not good, that's cool. We can convince our fans that the, the seventh overall pick is going to be him this year. But when you don't have that pick to convince your fan base about being, being bad is okay, you have to go out there. You got to do things to make yourself better. And that is the place that they're going to be in after 2026 with no first round picks of their own until 2029. Um, let me know what you think. I, I think that I didn't watch a ton of Brooklyn Nets last season. So when you talk about player evaluation for even some of the younger dudes, I don't have a ton like even I've mentioned on Twitter before that Cam Thomas is this this really uh, tough spot for me to scout and talk about about him being a future what in the NBA is he a future All Star or is he a future Jordan Clarkson I literally do not know I couldn't I couldn't tell you this year is going to help that out a lot um, and yeah it's Brooklyn Nets.